following is a conversation I had with Jake Muse of Maui Nui Venison. We talked a ton about hunting axis deer in Hawaii, but we also dove deep into some super interesting topics. We talked about Jake's technology that he uses on the Hawaiian Islands to count literally almost every axis deer within a certain landmass. The other thing we talked about is the harvest process that Jake uses to actually harvest thousands of wild axis deer in the field, getting them through a USDA process where they can actually enter the food system. They get to iterate on that process so much, there's little details that I think any hunter can gain some value from listening to. And the last thing guys, we touch on the health benefits of eating game meat. And you guys are gonna see from the quality of the video, I didn't have any intention of using this as a video for the channel, but I think there's so much value for you guys, I wanted to post it. If you're interested in just listening to the audio version of this conversation, you can look it up on any podcast platform. It's on the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. If you do get value from the video, please like it and subscribe to the channel. Let's go. Uh, thanks, Cliff. I appreciate um, the opportunity to be here and, and talk story. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, um, been in Hawaii now for 22 years, came out here from northern Alberta um, and just fascinated with access deer. And a long story short there was um, ended up creating a business and we think of it more as, as a, as a solution, but, uh, that's called Maui Nui Venison. And, and our mission is to help balance access to your populations on Maui for the betterment of our ecosystems, communities, and, and food systems. So, um, been obsessed with access to for basically 20 years. Um, I, I hunt a few other animals every once in a while. I get to like, just got back from Colorado a little while ago, but like, okay, they're it, man. That's like, it's all I think about day and night. So excited to give you guys some more details for sure. Yeah. So your, your original exposure to axis deer was just recreational hunting. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So came from, you know, basically Northern Alberta, grew up eating moose meat, um, showed up here in Hawaii to play uh, division one, volleyball for the University of Hawaii and then got stuck with a roommate from Molokai, which is this small island off of Oahu and had no idea like the amount of fish and game that were here from a recreational standpoint and obviously grew up doing that. So it was immediately kind of adopted into that family and that environment and found kind of a home away from home really fast. Um, and Axis Deer were just they were an incredible, like they're extremely difficult to hunt. So they're like really challenging and they're a lot of fun and they're just an amazing resource to be able to bring venison back, you know, to your dorm room every second or third weekend. Cause we were all broke and we yeah. made some extra, having some extra deer meat in the freezer was always a good thing. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. And you're, you're not the first individual that's told me how difficult they are to hunt. I have a bunch oh. of you know, very proficient bow hunter friends. And they all say like, you know, they went there and they're like, yeah, it's, it's difficult, man. They're, uh, yeah. um, and, uh, and why, why is that Jake? Like from your perspective? Um, I think a couple of things, one, uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, you grow up with tigers and leopards around. Sure. And not only that, but you grow up with tigers and leopards in like really dense brushy areas. So they, although like at night, they'll prefer a lot of like the open range, they actually like really prefer these dense areas. And so in India and here in Hawaii, they'll find like partner mammals. Like in India, I, I think those were langur monkeys and here they use minor birds. Like they're so smart that they're teaming up with other animals to help like pay attention for them. Sure. Um, and I think there's just like, those are two animals that are, already probably some of the top predators in the world um in these dense areas in there being like you know a tiger and a leopard that could be in the trees above you i think you evolve with those things around you're already like really switched on for a bunch of different reasons and then they just they just have like incredible eyesight they smell really well they just have all of it like they have the trifecta of those things that just make them really really tough to get around and then the other part of it here specifically in hawaii is um they have an abundance of food so when you look at their grazing patterns on a daily basis like they 
sit like they're they're not really betting they're kind of betting and feeding and like, like they're constantly chewing that cud like they have an abundance of food they can stop at any time they want there isn't this like you can tell when they're moving around there isn't this sense of urgency to eat at all times so they're just oh, like you. so they have this constant food source and they really can like when they're concerned about something you can tell like they stop and they stop for like a long time like my favorite thing is when somebody new comes one of my buddies comes and they hunt and like a doe busts us and she starts staring us down and they're like, okay, we'll just wait. And I'm like, Oh no, no, we're done. Like yeah. <laughs> she's not like we're in this for like 45 minutes. If you want to like try and stick this thing out, like we can go over here and try and find something else. Like she's not giving up. Like she's not going back to eating anytime soon. And they're just like, what? I'm like, Oh yeah, no, this is uh yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I have a, a tag along question to that, man. Cause I think you probably have a unique ability to answer it. Cause you know, my understanding listening to you on other podcasts is, is you've, you've hunted probably heavily hunted axis deer. And then in your business, you're, you're putting your own pressure on the deer as you guys harvest them. Yeah. Do you notice, and, and I guess I'll give you a little background on this. In my years of elk hunting, I noticed a huge, like the difference between a heavily pressured elk versus one that's on a private ranch who, that only gets hunted four or five days a year. It's, it's literally like a different species. You know what yeah. I mean, Jake? Like it's, it, it, to compare the two is not, not fair, but I know other species are, are different. Do you, what do you find in that regard with axis deer? Are they, are they just naturally really keen or does hunting pressure, you know, come into play? No, so you nailed it. They, I think axis deer start at a different level as most right. other sure. animals. And then on top of that, I think they're probably one of the most intelligent animals like I've ever hunted and had an opportunity to hunt a lot of different ones. When you start educating them, they just get smarter and smarter and smarter. So we are specifically pressuring areas to move their home ranges so that there's more yeah. feed for uh, cattle ranchers or farmers or whatever that looks like. Um, but we give you a great example. We use, uh, we use FLIR drones every single night. So we have a drone a thousand feet in the air watching what we're doing and deer that are already educated to what we're doing. They can hear our UTV a mile and a half away and in the dark, they'll start moving off of the roads, which is primarily where we like harvest off of. Sure. And they'll just move to an area that can't be seen from the roads and they just sit there and wait. Yeah. Like they're so smart. Um, and so I think like that exact same thing translates to elk. Like when I think these animals like educate themselves really well, and that's just a function of pressure. And so the more pressure you put on them and the more like negative conditioning that like they're like oh wait that's like i recognize what that sound is i recognize what's going on here like this isn't safe um they just get smarter and smarter and that's why you know those really old ones are hard to find those really yeah, old yeah. Ones hard, like that's the exact reason is they start like recognizing that um conditioning and then they, they don't move there so um 100 so we use that to our advantage like we use the understanding of that behavior to our advantage here to help like serve community better yeah, yeah, and you're, you, I'm sure you have to, you know, from a practical aspect, just model that into how you're harvesting animals. And yeah. I could probably dig crazy deep into that, but I, it, it's, it's interesting to me, Jake, because I, over the years, you know, I, I guided primarily mule, mule deer and elk hunts, and I always feel like when I've described the dynamic that you just mentioned, like, hey, they, they do learn over time. You know, they know when we put a camp in this area, the whole dynamic changes. Oh, yeah. I was doing a bunch of backcountry stuff. So, but, but I noticed that if we go put in wall tents, it's like the first night you start a fire, the dynamic changes a little bit, you know, just little things like that. And I always feel like when I've said that to people, they partially believe it, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, but what's cool about uh, what you just said is you actually have the, the evidence of it in your, in your business. Well, I'll give you a really specific example. That's actually a little bit scary is our, um, in some of the, in early on in the, uh, maybe like seven or eight years ago, we used spotlights, which is legal here to do so at night if with a permit. Okay. Sure. 
as we were working in these particular areas, we had a couple projects. And as you're getting to the end of this project, and that and it was a closed area of 800 acres, um, and we had negatively conditioned these deer a bunch of times, like bumped into them, weren't able to shoot them because we have to like we have to harvest, we have to like render every single one in the head. It has to be shot in the head. Yeah. Um, and four of these deer figured out if they like started moving their head around, like they were moving their head, I think originally to like move away from the light. Yeah. And the last entire month that we were chasing these four deer, when the light went on them, they literally would like start bobbing their head up and down. Like they'd be moving, like it'd be like, <laughs> they're moving them like rhythmic side. It's like they learned that specific behavior was keeping them safe. And that's not a behavior that like they for any evolutionary reason would have like developed, like they sure. developed based on the conditioning we provided them. Yeah. So they are like, they're crazy smart. Um, and I think yeah, all yeah. that was given enough conditioning, like we'll start completely changing behavior. So like wall tent and fire, they're like, yeah, this is not, this is not a great idea. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. And like you say, it takes, it. it's like, uh, they're just reacting to, uh, yeah. I mean, you, you call it intelligence and I, and, uh, I call it that too, but I don't know the right word. You know what I mean, Jake? Because to me, it's more just like they're reacting to the stimuli. And once they, it only takes a few times and they realize like, okay, we're not going to do that anymore. You know, yeah. it's kind yeah, of, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting in, in that regard. And, uh, you know, let's just hit on that right now, Jake, because I'm sure a lot of the listeners would, would want to kind of get some context around this conversation before we get deep into your, your business. If somebody were, you know, they, they were wanting to come out and hunt axis deer in Hawaii. Do you have thoughts on, you know, when the best time to come is, uh, I I'm very naive to them, Jake. I haven't, I haven't hunted them. Um, I mean, I don't even know when they shed their velvet, you know, when they have antlers, can you hit all that stuff real quick? Just so, so people kind of, um, get a little information on, on that side of things. Yeah. Um, so the kind of pronounced rut period is, typically like April through June. And it's not really pronounced. And one of the reasons it's not pronounced is axis deer are one of the few deer that their um, their sperm is viable year round. So after they cast those antlers, they're still able to breed every single doe, which isn't the case for most other deer species, right? right. And so what ends up happening is through the years, there's been these like cyclical changes where there's a bunch of bucks that are like in off season so there'll be a bunch of bucks that are hard while other ones are developing velvet so you can actually find them all over the place so because all of like those bucks aren't essentially like rutting at the same time as the same time as like deer are the those are going into estrus there isn't really this pronounced period so it's pretty cool like from may through yeah april may through like june july you can find like box roaring and it getting like pretty exciting there for for those couple of months so that's typically the best time but i think one of the the things that are most exciting for um somebody from the continent that wants to come here and hunt is you can do it year round right sure. so there's no there's no bag limits here uh there's no seasons here i mean you can go online get your um hunting license for 100 bucks and you can essentially come anytime shoot as many deer as you want yeah. Um, and so I think most of the people that like, we end up like inviting, although like certainly they want to come during the rut, most of them end up being like here in like January and February when it's cold as hell, wherever they are. Yeah. It's the off season. It's yeah, like, it's an off season and they have to come like one guy described it as like flushing a bunch of birds every single day. Like there's just so many deer. There's just like so many opportunities that you get like a lifetime worth of hunting in, you know, like four or five days while you're here. So there's some really good, um, there's some good public lands on, um, uh, some on Maui, Lanai is, is really the place that they have really good established game management areas, uh, with the state. They have, um, hunts basically year round in a bunch of different areas. You can pull tags. There's some great outfitters over there. Um, so you can like, you're really going to enjoy it if you come year round, um, especially if you can bring your wife and kids at the same time yeah, and like sure. leave them at the beach for half the day and you can go half the day in the morning or something. Um, but if you're coming to find, like, if you're coming to chase a big buck, you're coming in, you know, kind of May through that June, July period. Yeah, I got you. 
And I think you hit on something that to me is very intriguing. And I think a lot of listeners, it will be too. And that's, you know, a lot of the hunts here in the 48 States that we do, you don't have a lot of opportunity. You know, yeah. if you're, if you're in an uh, over the counter elk hunting unit or something like that during archery season, you might have one opportunity, maybe two opportunities to shoot your bow. And the, the, the downside of that for sure is that you just don't get exposed to that part of the skill set. You know what I mean, yeah. Jake? I, I noticed that like individuals that let's say to me, an op, you know, an opportunity target rich environment that's closer to all of us is Texas, right? Here in the United sure. States. I noticed a lot of people who hunt Texas, that component of their hunting skill set, particularly bow hunters, they're just better at it because they get exposure. You know, yeah. they get a bunch of exposure. And I view it as, I mean, that's kind of one of the reasons I would love to come there is just like, can I go there, you know, 10 days access uh, deer hunting? I don't need to, you know, I'm not after the biggest deer ever. I just want a bunch of opportunities to stock, to shoot my bow. Is that, am I kind of on the right track in terms of that it's that kind of opportunity yeah the the probably the most value you get out of coming here is the repetitions of mistakes you make in stocking yeah sure so like when my, when buddies ask they're like hey what should i bring in every i was like bring 24 arrows and they're yeah. like what <laughs> like i only you know normally going for one i'm like bring 24 arrows yeah because you're gonna jump 20 of those for sure and it typically takes a like somebody that hasn't worked with access deer for a while. They can get lucky if we sit them down and like it's the perfect morning. But if we're like spot and stock, like they're 10 to 15 tries in before they're even like drawing their bowl. Because yeah. it's but it's it's really awesome to go with them and be able to say, like, oh, you 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 knocked that arrow too fast. Or like when you moved around that corner, like you just moved a little like all of the repetition that comes with like being really great at stalking is like the biggest benefit because they're just like, they're just constantly busting you and busting you. And if you like, think about it and you even like take some notes down, like you'll find out really quickly, like, Oh, I need to move a lot slower or that wind wasn't perfect. But you then, as soon as you like, as soon as you're done and you're like, damn it, you're like, Oh, there's more deer right there. So you get to go yeah. do it again and again yeah. and again. Yeah, you get, it, you get to iterate on it, which I, I think, I mean, if anybody's, and I know you have history as, a, as an athlete, uh, Jake, but if anybody's into like any skill set, at, you know, athletics or anything, being able to iterate like real yeah. quickly yeah. in hunting, in hunting, it's so, um, there's just, you don't get the opportunity. The vast, vast majority of hunting, you don't get to iterate like that. And yeah. I've actually over my, you know, it, even all the exposure I would get in the Western States still, I mean, you're talking about probably on one hunt, a guy's getting the number of stocks he gets in maybe five years of hunting, you, oh, know, I, you know, so it's, it's huge. And then plus, like you say, like he gets to immediately think about what went wrong, you know? Yeah. I was, we were in, I've done two years of like high country mule deer in Colorado. And oh, okay. my first year I went with like a couple of buddies that are, like arguably really good at it they've had a lot of sure. success and the first year like finally found a nice one and i'm like let's go and they're like what are you talking about they're like we're gonna like this is gonna take us two days i'm like what are you talking about let's let's go <laughs> right now and they're like no, no no like that's not that's not how this is done here like if you blow that like we're done that guy's going up and over and we're never gonna see him again so it's been this awesome lesson for me because i've learned to be so aggressive as a hunter here sure. um <laughs> like go and do meal deer and then being like no no no, wait like we're not going anywhere you're gonna sit in glass for the next two days so yeah yeah, I, yeah. I, know how, I know how it feels yeah yeah well that's like western hunter the I, I think as people get proficient at it they do exactly what you're saying they learn how to take the risk out of the situations and, yeah. and one part of that is probably because they're not quite you know i'm probably not near as proficient as you are at stock and deer because you've gotten so much practice at it yeah. But the other thing is, it's just the risk of it getting blown is like, it's like season devastating, you know? What I mean? yeah. So, yeah. So, you, you know, different styles uh, develop out of that. Um, before we jump off of uh, just, you know, hunting opportunities in Hawaii, um, what other opportunities are there, Jake? I see guys with goats, cheap, that stuff. Is that, is that as readily available as axis deer hunting? 
Um, what you, what are your thoughts on those opportunities? Yeah, so across Hawaii, there's um, there's goats, sheep, uh, there's both uh, purebred mouflon and hybrid sheep and feral sheep. Um, obviously, there's pigs all over the place. Uh, Kauai, which is a really interesting story that ties into Blackdale or, or that ties into Axis Deer, is Kauai, um, which is a small island uh, within like the northern side of Hawaii, like. Kauai got blacktail introduced the same time Maui got access deer introduced. So in the late 60s, early 70s, you can still barely find a blacktail on Kauai. Like they're in these crazy, think of like sure. those dense BC areas and all like they're in like the densest forest of Kauai and they're like mythical creatures like nobody yeah. ever sees them. Um, but it's a great comparison to say like blacktail went to Kauai and Axis deer went to Maui at essentially the exact same time. And there's 70,000 deer on Maui and you can hardly find them on Kauai. And that's the real difference between them being able to breed year round. So just oh, a side. I got you. Yeah. So blacktail on Kauai, goats essentially almost, almost every single island. Lots of, uh, lots of public hunting areas, but like any place, like kind of need, yeah, sure. need to reach out to somebody like to get some, to get some pointers on like where to go and a bunch of different things. But Essentially, every island has hunting every day where you can like you can pick up your bow and go for sure. Yeah, go on. Um, it, it's uh, it's interesting, man. You hit on something that I wanted to talk about in this conversation, and that's that. It, I don't think hunters realize like your situation in Hawaii with the um, you know the non-native and invasive species, however you want to categorize them. It's actually people don't realize in the western states like colorado a lot of the species that we hunt yeah they are they're native species to certain areas in the 48 states but not necessarily where they're at mm -hmm. now so i i uh, and as we dive into this i think you'll you'll see jake i'm very interested in that whole conversation um yeah. you know i i even mountain goats in colorado a lot of people don't realize that technically that's an invasive species you know oh, no way. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that the, not to get off on a tangent, but there's really only proof that they naturally were in, you know, down to like the Northern part of Idaho. The, oh, they, wow. were, they were transplanted into most areas they are in Colorado. And then in the reality is genetically the vast, vast majority of elk in Colorado are not, they're not, you know, they are transplants, huh. um, you know, from, from whenever we, you know, the, all the settlement of the West and all that, you know, brought all those species down, all the market hunting. Well, they were, they came back with, from transplants from other places. And I, the, the reason I get off on that tangent is um, I, it, it's interesting to me, the mentality of introducing these species, you know, in the last uh, hundred years, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, it wasn't abnormal. You know, I mean, you know, and even before in, in Hawaii, but, you know, they did that in New Mexico. They introduced a bunch of different oryxes. They introduced the ibex, all these different things. But the point I was going to make is it relates to the blacktail is it's amazing to me that some of them do just awesome and some of them peter out. You yeah. know what I mean? They, they, they do, they do too awesome. Some of them, you know, yeah. in the end and then, and then other, others vanish. I, I find this. I find this super intriguing when we talk about game animals. Like it sounds like to me and tell me if I'm wrong, but axis deer, I mean, they must be pretty adaptable, right? Oh, Jake, is that, yeah. is that the case? Yeah, um, absolutely. They're, um, and, and you're right. Maybe intelligence is the wrong word. Adaptable is maybe a much greater word. They're able to adjust a home range from like a mile and a half to 10 acres, depending on like, pressure and feed and water. Um, we did a project on the big island, which doesn't have any, well, it doesn't have any axis deer on it right now, but four axis deer were illegally introduced to the big island, which is, you know, a million plus acres. The area of introduction was like a hundred thousand square miles. Yeah, and I heard, I heard a rumor you killed them. We did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there was basically, it was a, it was a three year hunt and it was almost like a three year backpack hunt, like sure. where they were located. Basically it took us seven months to find any sign of them. 
because we had to cover such a huge area. And, and this will come back to the adaptable side of it is the reason it took so long is they found this really interesting lava tube that was collecting water, had a water trough at the end, had the right feed profile, was like just far enough away from like different sets of pressure and stuff. Sure. And, and when we originally found them before we like bumped their home range, they had been in less than like a 40 acre area for over a year. Yeah. Which you think is highly unnatural for deer species to like not want to roam and like have like a given home range. Right. Um, so extremely adaptable and probably one of the reasons like they've proliferated the way that they have is I think they're able to go find these little safe cubby holes that um, they can be in there for a long time and grow until like the density becomes so uncomfortable that they basically have to move to the next area. Right. Right. And uh, in that story, I, I, on the Atia podcast, um, that's a great story. You get in depth and I think listeners should go listen to it. So we don't, we don't need to re- re- yeah. totally go through the whole thing, but it's a really cool story, uh, Jake. And uh, it brings up when I heard the story the first time, it brought up a thought to me. So somebody, somebody actually brought the deer uh, from one of the other islands. I'm, I'm assuming a secret. Yeah, they, to the they, big they, island. Flew, they flew them over by helicopter. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So, so there's, a, there's, uh, it's obvious to me, and this is very prevalent with a lot of the, you know, exotics in different parts of the States. There's always this like tension, right? Because, y- you know, there's a certain part of the, um, you know, the biological community that doesn't want any invasives. And yeah. then there's a contingent of people that really enjoy hunting them. And I think me and you are probably included in, in that. Yeah. Um, but there's a, there's, it's like this huge spectrum. Like some people are like, I don't care what the invasive is affecting. I want as much abundance of that invasive species as possible because I really love hunting them. And then at the very other end of the spectrum, there's people that say they need to be, you know, totally, totally uh, um, just wiped off. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and I personally, it, your business is around, you know, like encompassing, trying to find the balance in that. And I just yeah. want to hear your thoughts, Jake, how do you, how do you justify where you're at on that scale and where your business is at on that scale? Yeah, we, we think of it from like a, it's a really good question and, and balance is not like an easy answer. It's like a very loaded, like sure. loaded. Word. And and so what we try and do is like, what is two things one we're constantly thinking about what is best for our communities so we're the most isolated landmass on the planet we import like 90 percent of our food so the idea of having a constant nutrient dense food source in deer like makes a lot of sense but the other side of that like you've said is like we are also the endangered species capital of the world like there are every species has a right to exist in its own place and access deer impact that so what we try and think through is like, where, where do these deer belong? And we believe they belong within our food system. And if you think sure. of like Hawaii as mountain to ocean or Moka to Makai, all of our mountain areas are these like critical ecological areas that house all of our endangered species, collects all of our water. Guess what? If we run out of water, we're in a lot of trouble. Um, but as you come down slope to the places where we create food, those are kind of the areas that we think through, like these would be great places to have like long-term sustainable populations of deer where they're most accessible to hunters um, in that, like they're in these mid elevation ranges um, and they're a net positive to food systems. So it's this constant balance for us, but ultimately we get to provide the tool for it, but in the end, we don't really decide. So we provide a service to large landowners. We don't operate on public lands. It's illegal for us to operate on public lands just like anywhere else. Um, But what we're able to do through like those, we do highly accurate surveys with forward looking infrared. I mean, we have a lot to learn in everything we do, but if there's one thing that like, I don't mind speaking confidently to, it's it's our surveys. Um, We developed that with that project on the big island to try and like find them. But we basically have the best forward-looking infrared in the world. And we do these surveys out of helicopter that give us like extreme confidence in the total number of deer. And the reason I mentioned that is we go to the like that large landowner or manager and say, 
you have 6,000 deer, how many do you want? So they're making the decision of balance because as an invasive species in Hawaii, the burden of those deer and their relative resource fall to the landowner. They're not managed by the state. So right. it's up to the private landowner to, to decide what to do with them. We provide them with highly accurate data. And then we say, like, we give them the tool that says like, okay, if you want it to be 2000 instead of 6,000, like we can do that for you. Like that's what the tool is. Um, but collectively, like our communities have to decide what long-term balance looks like. And what's awesome is all of our community, like the vast majority of our community here, it's not split. Like the vast majority of the community on Maui is saying we want a long-term balanced population. Nobody's really pushing for eradication. And even our, like, even our hunting communities are saying like, like there's too much. Yeah, um, sure. You're seeing, you know, especially when our hunters see on some of our other islands, Maui's population is still growing. Um, but on Lanai and Molokai, those populations have basically grown to their, well, not their max capacity, but they're basically, population is only going up and down there with available feed. So we're getting these big die-offs. So yeah. last year, we had thousands and thousands of deer essentially just die of malnutrition on Molokai and Lanai, these two other islands that we don't work on at the moment. And for our hunting community, you imagine like, that's a continual resource for you. And you, you go out to like utilize that resource and you can't like, they're dying. They're malnourished. Like you can't even utilize that resource. It's so, um, it's so out of balance. So I think right. even our hunting community is saying like, yeah, less deer means healthier deer for everybody. So, um, collectively, I think our communities here, especially on Maui have decided like, yeah, there's, there's gotta be a balance here. They can't just keep going the way that it's going. Yeah. And I could see, um, you know, I, over the years, you know, I've been around hunters and myself, you know, you know, when you observe an animal that's unhealthy or doing oh. por poorly for hunters in particular, it's, I think it's, and tell me your opinion on it, Jake, but I think it's really striking to hunters because they know like they're used to hunting a really healthy animal. They, they know what a healthy one looks like. So when they observe one that's struggling, it's much more, I don't know if it's just they recognize the relative difference, but it's, I mean, it's very striking to me. If I see like a sick animal, it's like, oh. it, it, it kind of makes your, your, your stomach roll. Where, where somebody who doesn't hunt, they, I don't even think they really notice, you know, it, it, whereas a hunter can like, I mean, you can drive past a field, right. And there's a, you know, there's a white tail out there doing poorly. And generally a hunter will know immediately, like something's wrong with that deer, yeah. you know? Um, so uh, I'm sure that's the case, man, where, where you're saying these, these animals are doing poorly hunters observe it and they're not, they're not fans, you know? Yeah. And, and ultimately I think that's where our, a lot of support for finding balance is comes from as well. Like ultimately it was my initial trigger point, you know, what was 20, what was like probably 20 or 18 years ago was the first time I saw like a die off, like it came around the corner like we were walking, came around the corner to our regular spot and there was like 20 or 30 deer and they weren't dead yet, but they were laying and they couldn't move. They were so malnourished. And I was just like, like, you're, you're just like, what? Yeah. What's going on? Like, and it was the trick. And that was a trigger for me to be like, wait, like there, we got to Like, we got to do something. There has to be something to do. Like, um, so yeah, completely. And then vice versa. Hunters are the first person that are able to see, and you've seen this, like, when you just see like an extremely healthy animal, like you see that bull or that animal that you're just like, whoa. <laughs> like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, our, our hunting community plays, our recreational hunting community plays a major role in, in long-term balance here uh, on Maui for sure. Yeah. And it sounds like to me, you know, you, you, you make an effort to get, I know that you're doing it on private land and there's, the, yep. so there's, there's a, there's obviously just kind of a, a division there where you're not like stepping on, you know, subsistence slash public land hunters or, or however you classify them in Hawaii. Um, but it sounds like you do an effort. You have a, you're making an effort, Jake, to not that, not that be an issue. I, I, I've been around, you know, game management programs here in the U S where that's, that could, that's always an issue. You know yeah. what I mean? If, if, uh, you know, here with elk, it's about cow elk, right? People want opportunities for their kids to hunt cow elk late in the season, but that's always a rift. You know, there's always these these things. And that's the most interesting 
part of your business, I think, or one of the more interesting parts is I, I just know from my minimum exposure to it that you've had to deal with a lot of regulatory stuff that people probably don't don't understand um, or they don't have a really good good grip on. And uh, just give me give me give me an idea of what those challenges have been. I mean, hit hit on the USDA thing, you know, hit on working with ranchers. Uh, more than anything, Jake, I'm just curious because I know that those are like very difficult things to to do. Yeah, um, it took a long time. It took about like seven years to essentially jump through all the different hurdles to be able to harvest like a wild invasive animal here in Hawaii under USDA inspection so that like that animal can be sold. And basically like where it starts is the USDA FSAS food safety inspection services has this giant like book that you'd imagine all of our government agencies have yeah, that sure. have like a million rules in it. And they, they were always, un, they are unwilling to change those rules. That's like the federal meat inspection act that that's what operates like across the country. And so we had to figure out within that giant book, how to meet all of the rules and expectations, but in the field. And luckily, um, there was a guy here in there, some nerdman in the 70s that, that laid some of the, the initial groundwork to get like a few things changed. But basically, we have to follow every single rule you would see in like a typical brick and mortar slaughter facility. So the inspectors have to be able to view that animal, tell that it's healthy, like that process of like transporting the animal, and everything that has to be humane, which we get to skip, obviously, because it's wild. But the toughest thing is... The terminology is rendering, but you have to render that animal. You have to shoot that animal in the head the same way a slaughter facility would at the same proficiency as a cow that goes into a chute, gets a head clamp, and you can stand right there and shoot it in the head. So that's like, it's taken a long time to develop the, like the harvesting system that allows us to do that. But then there's mobile slaughter units and food safety and food safety plans and insurance and like all these things that come along with you producing like a food product for human consumption and sale that have just taken a long time to figure out like, okay, how do we make sure, seems like a small thing, but like, how do we make sure in a three hour period, we can go find deer, harvest them, bleed them, transport them back to our mobile slaughter facility get them completely processed clean and not have a single hair on it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and go, go yeah. for it. Go. Well, oh, I, Jake, like you left me with so many questions, uh, Jake. And I, I think um, I have a little back. I've, I've been in USDA, like beef processing facilities. Oh, awesome. And so um, I don't think most listeners will understand that we all view game meat that we harvest. We view it as very clean source of protein. We have a lot of, we put it in high regard, but it, tell me if I'm wrong, Jake, but I think 99% of the meat that we put in freeze, our freezer as hunters would not pass. You know, like it, would, it wouldn't get through the process, you know, like one hair, any sort of fluid, all that stuff. Like you're talking about a very sanitary say, environment. I, Go ahead. I can say I can say hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it's not, it's not only that it's like all of the small nuance to like sanitize your knife between touching your scabbard and the animal and certain rinse down or like procedures for like when guts are awful come out like it. Yeah. It's so we had to, what's interesting is we took all of our hunting experience and all of the things that go wrong when you try and de like debone an animal on the ground and we designed like this really unique mobile slaughter system so that we minimize the number of times we were essentially like touching an animal. So sure. it, it went from, I think our first week or so using our mobile slaughter unit, we, it took us about like 20 minutes a deer. And now we do a deer in under a minute, like it, like under a minute, it's clean without a hair on it. Yeah. So, so gut, gutted and skinned in under a minute. That's amazing, yeah. man. And, um, and it's not just like ultimately we created the system, but then you have to get all these amazing team members to come on board and get them like highly, highly trained. Because if you mess up any of that, the USDA is like, oh, here's a write up. 
oh, you're done for the day. Like there's all this like risk that goes oh, along. So it's not, it's not like that individual animal has to be uh, chucked or used in a different way. It's like, you're done for the day until you oh, fix yeah. the process. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah like, I got you. There's, um, it took us a long time to get to the point where there wasn't like continual risk every single day of the USDA being like, this isn't good enough. This isn't good enough. This isn't good enough. Um, yeah, and, yeah. Every, and but the learning lesson was over the seven years is every time they said like, it wasn't good enough. It was, well, what's the, like, how do we solve that? So it was yeah, just sure. constant problem solving for like, there wasn't like a one solution on day one, like last week we changed something to get even better. Um, right. So yeah, it's just this constant evolution of like, how do you go harvest a wild animal in the field and basically in 45 minutes have it back cleaned like not a single hair on it under inspection so we've got like you know our guys we think of our guys as like there's very specific guys that shoot but they're actually the least like not useful but like our drivers have to be able to average at night so we do all of our harvesting at night we basically have rally car drivers yeah so sure. Like we train our guys when we bring guys on everything's at night you can't see anything like we make them go run the roads during the day so they know where every rock is and everything else because if they don't average like 15 to 25 miles off road which is pretty fast yeah, yeah sure like they won't get deer back to the unit fast enough to clean them oh i got you so like and then we've got we call them like our crossfit athletes but like we have to we can't physically drag any single deer so if our shooter shoots something at like 180 yards, we basically have guys sprinting in the dark to pick up a 200 pound deer, throw on their back and like sprint it back because the seven minutes, if it can be five minutes instead of nine minutes, that's all time we get back because we only have a three hour window to make everything happen every single night. So like, it's just this incredible team of guys that each play like a very specific role. Um, and each one of the small nuances of each one of their positions equates to getting enough deer every, back every night to actually have an impact on ecosystems and communities um, and keep like that solution working on a nightly basis. Yeah. yeah, And, and keeps your, keeps your business, yeah. business going. And that's, it's, it's crazy to think about that. I mean, and this is just, just my thought on it. My thought on it, Jake is like, wow, probably a lot of these regulations are just egregious, but that doesn't matter because you have to comply because you're yeah. and I, I should have mentioned this in the introduction, you sell this access deer meat on your website, right? So, so anybody can buy it. So it goes into the food system. So it has to can, comply with this. Um, but it's just amazing. The, and, and you said it a couple of times because I think in your voice, I could tell like, you know, that, that is a quite of a co accomplishment and that's not a single hair on the meat. Like that's like, it, try to go look at like a hunter's quarters and like find yeah. somebody that doesn't have a single hair on the, meat. you know what I mean? Like there's, you, you probably, it'd be hard to get under probably 50 or under a hundred hairs. You know what I mean? So, yeah. uh, no, I, I hear you is it's this process you guys have to have to go through, which is pretty, pretty amazing. It, to be honest, I, I, and it's one of the reasons the business is so intriguing to me is I didn't even really think it was possible. You know what I mean? In, in a lot of, in a lot of ways, I know that, uh, yeah, I know there's prob probably maybe the closest analogy on, on earth is they do some of this in New Zealand. Is that yeah. right, Jake? So yeah. have you, uh, well, I I'm going to, I'm going to circle back to that. Cause I have one question in that discussion that I want to hit on before we, we jump into that. But so keep that New Zealand point in your head, but I know that listeners and myself will be very interested in this. It's just the mechanics of how you're actually harvesting the animals as hunters. I think we're just, you were going to be curious to this because you, you have to be at a certain level of proficiency that I think all of us as hunters would probably want to be. So do you mind telling me Jake, like what the exact equipment you guys use, like the caliber of your rifle, you know, the rest you guys use, any of that stuff. Do you, do you mind just nerding out on that for, for a second? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have, and it's one of the other things that like it has evolved a lot over the years, but we can't leave the road. So that the harvesting or like the rendering process starts with a forward looking infrared binocular unit that our spotter is using. 
that feeds into a video screen that the USDA official is viewing. Okay. And so imagine like coming up over a hill in your UTV, we use Yamaha Vikings. Um, coming up over the hill, like everything's black and there's a group of deer at 105 yards. And this binocular is so good that at seven miles, I could tell you the difference between a goat and a deer. I got you. So at 105 yards, you can see like every hair, you can see abscesses and because it's heat based. Like, you know, if they're pregnant, like, you know, everything about this animal, it follows kind of step one in that giant rule book of, is that animal healthy? Yeah. I so got you. shooting starts there. Um, and the shooter has, so we're using either, and it's not actually our preferred round. We're using 308 or 22 mag and we don't have suppressors aren't legally like we can't use suppressors here in Hawaii, which would, which would oh, be a okay. huge. Yeah. So it makes it, makes it, makes it pretty tough. But sure. um, the reason we're using 308 and 22 mag is because it's the only ammunition we can buy in bulk. Yeah. Sure. Um, so we, I'd love to be using like a 22 to 50 or something that shoots flatter. Cause it's hard to get ranges at night. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we use 308 and, and 22 mag anytime, like we're basically inside 50 yards, we'll use a 22 mag. Anything outside of 50 yards, we'll use a 308. And that next step, all of our shooters are using the best FLIR equipment we can get on, like as FLIR scopes um, with, and the reason being is the more pixelated a head gets out past a hundred yards, it like really starts to affect your aim point. And here's how we're able to, render at the same efficiency as we do in a plant is we train all of our guys, which like it takes us a certain type of person to do this. It takes like a certain uh, type of mentality. We train all of them to have to miss 30% of the time. And so I'll explain that is basically all of our guys that want to be a shooter for us have to be able to shoot a one inch group at 200 yards. So like they start there and then like, they need to understand deer behavior. Like it takes them a year plus to understand deer behavior, like as a spotter or as a driver, like watching those videos, seeing how they move their head, like seeing when they're going to stop. Like you really have to understand like every single one of their movements. And then what we do is if you think of like your typical bullseye, um, we make them basically bump up their aim point 30%. So you're aiming high, right? Because if we miss and if we miss high and that animal walks away, nothing bad happens. Like right. you get fined by the USDA, nothing, like nothing there happens. Um, but the minute that bullet, cause it, we have to break the skull cap. So in order for it to be rendered immediately unconscious, you have to break the skull cap and think of that skull cap as like the size of an orange. Yeah. Um, and, and what takes like a really interesting perspective, like for your shooter is, a perfect shot is as good as a perfect miss. Yeah. So what ends up happening is we keep data on every single bullet, every single shot, all of these different things. And if they start shooting better than 70% in a night, they actually will get in trouble because what's end up happening is their aim point is dropping down further into the head. And yeah. when you can get in trouble is if you miss that skull cap and hit like anywhere no, in the face or neck or anything else. Yeah. Right. Um, so it takes a really interesting type of person to be able to shoot constantly all night long and be perfectly okay with like a perfect miss and then like a perfect shot following it. Because most people, when you miss something and you know you miss high, what are you going to do? Like you start, your brain starts to gradually pull yeah. that aim point down and like it happens like intuitively. You don't even think about it. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, they're, they're doing it without even without even knowing it. Uh, the, so, I, go ahead, Jake. Yeah, it just takes like a really disciplined person to be able to like shoot for our teams because the perfect night for them is them going back and looking at like the like the seventy rounds they put down like down range and knowing like thirty percent of them were perfect misses and like they're aiming for their, like they know at you know two hundred yards at a one inch group they're gonna miss thirty percent of the time if their aim point is basically on like the tip of that skull cap right? yeah I, so you're basically you're basically taking that rifle grouping and you're setting it where thirty percent of it clears the clears the animal's forehead yeah forehead. and it just ensures that nothing like drops down several inches and like gets like gets us yeah. in trouble yeah, yeah. and 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 uh 
uh, given that it's a, a hunting podcast, I, I, I think there's probably some value in this going into that a little bit, Jake. And I, uh, um, in, in tell me if what I've always done, if I, is when I've, as I've guided over the years, I've had people that as we usually, it's like a follow-up shot or something like that. People are, they ask me, do you want me to shoot them in the, in the head, you know? And yeah. I always say no. And the reason is, is because over the years I've dealt with deer and elk that have been hit in the face. Yep. And uh, I don't think people understand that you uh, like what you're doing. It takes a system like you're talking about because the that vital section is small part of the head. You know, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot there the na- the nasal cavity and all of that that is not. It, you know, it it's really can make the situation not not fun. Um, so I, it's it's really intriguing the system you've developed to deal with that. You know. Just this, yeah. like that, that you guys have obviously thought about that, and that to be proficient there, um, it's not easy. I think everybody would view that as like, well, of course, you just shoot them in the head, and it's like, well, yeah, well. No, oh, and like one of the hardest things is it. It's it's all happening at night through forward-looking infrared, and that is like you're still dealing with a digital image. So as you zoom in, especially like when there's velvet, so when there's velvet and there's heat coming off of that, oh, velvet, okay. Mud, it starts to form like a um, a misshapen head. Ah, you okay. Actually, you actually sometimes don't know exactly like where the head is. Um, so yeah, it, it it is definitely a skill. So like when a new shooter starts with us, like they've gone through all the training, everything else, like they start at 50%. Like I we want you. them missing half of the animals. And then like, if they can, sh- like if they're disciplined enough to shoot 50%, we move them to 60% and then we'll move them down to 70%. Um, but it's just like a, a really interesting discipline that comes with, you know, there's still a live animal moving around, like nodding its head, figuring out what to do, feeding, all of these different things. Um, so like all of our rests and the bags and everything you use to try and make everything stable, ultimately those UTV platforms are the best because you can like pivot them and move them around to get kind of the perfect angle on, on each one of these shots. Right. Um, but yeah, the whole system is, is been iterated over. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I mean, yeah. a one, and that's the thing, man, is a one inch group at 200 yards on a live animal. That's, that's hard. Like, yeah. You know, yeah, we're, um, I think we're going on like 30,000 deer now. So yeah, yeah. You get, you get some practice. No, yeah. I, I, yeah. Uh, I, I totally, Totally get it. And I didn't mean to dive crazy deep in that. I just, no, no, it's, it's a great question. Inter- it's very interesting to people when you, in, when you fathom what's really going on there, it's, it's, it's pretty involved. Um, let's jump back to the New Zealand uh, deal. Yeah. Jake. So a lot of what you've talked about is you guys have developed kind of some of your own technology. Like the first thing, when you talk about all the thermal stuff immediately, uh, what, what comes to my mind is, you know, why are these state game managers doing, why aren't they do that instead of, you know, counts out of a helicopter, it's just a bunch of questions I have in that regard. But before we talk about that, did you, did you kind of take anything that was going on in New Zealand and, and apply it to your business? Did you use it as a, as a plate, I guess, a resource? Yeah, absolutely. It was actually, um, my last year of college, I wrote a business plan based on the New Zealand model of like domestication or habituation. Um, and I had no idea that it was completely wrong. Like you can't domesticate access to your, a bunch of people have tried. You'd think like with as good as it tastes and it being able to breed year round, there'd be like domesticated access to everywhere across the world. But um, you just can't, there's such a fickle animal. But what was really interesting is the New Zealand developed this like, incredible deer industry basically from the 50s through 70s and 80s with like wild harvesting basically out of helicopters so they don't have to meet the first they have different rules and regulations so they don't have to meet the first step of being like the inspector being able to view the animal and see the whole process they can shoot an animal and bring it into the facility and then the usda or their usda can say like yeah that animal's healthy so what's really interesting what happened in new zealand was they built this entire deer industry, basically like culling deer out of helicopters, which is amazing. I think it ended up being like 7% of their GDP at its height. And then all of a sudden they're like, Oh wait, we can't find any more deer. Yeah. And so they pivoted to like then live capture and domestication, domestication and habituation. And like, now we have these like huge deer farms in New Zealand. 
And what was really interesting was we always took that into account because the old, like the expense now, guess what? All of those deer are, are not meant to be, even in these like giant stations, now they have antibiotics and now they have diseases and now they have like all these different things that they didn't have in the wild. And it was all because they couldn't collect that survey data. So if New Zealand would have had the tools that we have today, they'd have, I, I guarantee they're like, they're extremely smart, like forward looking conservationists. They're like, yeah, I they, they wouldn't have shot them out to the extent. Yeah. They just started surveying saying like, wait, if we try and domesticate these things, it's going to cost us a whole bunch more money. Like, let's just keep them wild, but let's keep sustainable numbers at this. Um, and just looking at the, like what they have to go through every single day now to like produce venison for their communities from these domesticated, like red stag and everything else, it's 10 times the effort of like shooting something in the wild. So yeah. we've learned a lot from, I think, a lot of the mistakes that may have, but also they didn't have like the technology and the data available to like keep this animal wild. Yeah. Uh, and that, and that hits on another question I have, Jake, and, and this is, this is just my opinion. I don't want it to reflect that it has your opinion at all, Jake, but my opinion is that in general, in the Western States of, of the U S the data in that's collected out of helicopters and counts is really poor. I, I, from my experience with it, it's very, very poor, you know, year to year, you know, the, the it's just in, it's for a whole bunch of reasons, how much it costs, the technology, all of that. Um, so I think that, uh, that we probably always overweight the value of that. I really do. That's my personal opinion. I think we underrate, we underrate, um, the value of people's opinion that are just in the field, be it, you know, just people enjoying wildlife, hunters, guides, outfitters, you know, local wardens or whatever who are out in the field that always gets discounted to like count data. Yeah. I think, I think that, I think my personal view is that that's a big problem with the management of Western um, big game populations. Why, why are, why are they still doing that? And why aren't they doing what you're doing? <laughs> not, uh, not to like put you on the spot. I'm just, no, curious. it's a, it's a really good question. Cause it applies here in Hawaii because we do what we do on private land and our state employees, which, you know, operate like very, very similar to the way you would in Montana or something else with fish and wildlife. Um, they do it the old school way, and we've asked them the same question. And so where they're using scat plots or distance sampling or all these different like methods that have been used for 50, 60 years, um, we can come along like a great example is uh, we did, we did a survey of 160,000 acres uh, about a year ago. And that is an exact count. It's a, it's a minimum of a certain number of deer to within about 95% accuracy using that like survey, that FLIR technology, the state, did what you guys would know as a typical like count survey out of a helicopter. They're looking at a helicopter and then they use something called distance sampling, which calculates the distance from the helicopter, the relative angle. And then they basically use math to extrapolate the total number. They got 10,000. We got 60,000. Yeah. And, and that, that can like, that can work the complete opposite direction too. Like if they happen to fly over the line that has more deer, that math, like they could have flown the wrong line and that could have been, they could have got a hundred thousand and we could have got 60,000. Yeah. So it's, I don't have the answer. I know it's cost prohibitive, but I just, I also just know, you know, our government agencies are giant boats that take a really, really long time to turn because if there's all this hysterical, historical data used with a particular methodology and they're trying to make decisions like based on the difference yeah. year to year. Yeah. It, I, you know, I, I remember like sitting on a slope in Colorado and thinking like, if I had like, if I had that binocular unit, like I could tell you every animal that's in this basin, like in like this 40,000 acres. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And I just, and I just think, yeah, It'll get there. I think there's, I think there'll be enough pressure for great data along the way, especially when like poor decisions on with bad data are being made. Um, 
Yeah. And I think, I think you hit on it a little bit there, Jake. And, and I don't, and I have this conversation a lot, so I don't want to just crap on, you know, oh, state yeah. game departments, but what, what I, what I found is the first thing that needs to happen is there needs to be an acknowledgement amongst the hunting community and the management community, community of wildlife that the data is not that good. Yeah. You know, uh, that's, that's my view on it. As I, I think there's this clinging on to it that, oh, it's pretty accurate. No, it's not. I mean, there's units in Colorado, Jake, that I've counted more mountain goats in, in one day than they claim the whole population is or in the, in vice, vice versa. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, it, you know, it's, it's, you know, so it's, I think there first needs to be this acknowledgement that, that probably, it probably could have some improvement. And it sounds like you're an example of that, you know, having, and you hit on other stuff too, just the, everybody, the dynamic of, you know, counting one section and then extrapolating it to, you know, total population and total population dynamics is, it's really messy, you know. Well, for, for us, it was like, we started as like the recreational hunter and, cer and I certainly still am, but like every single day I feel accountable to our communities for resource availability. Sure. And holy shit, I'm not doing that unless I have good data. Like, I yeah. would. Yeah, I mean, if the like, rancher wants 6,000 deer, you don't want to knock it back down to 1,500 on accident. Exactly. So yeah. like, like I, would, I would never do the work we're doing without that tool. I would never yeah. feel, I would just never feel comfortable doing it. Um, so yeah, hopefully we like, hopefully we see some improvement both within like Hawaii, but like also would love to see that technology and methodology used across the Western states for sure. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. Um, I will, we'll just change uh, subjects here, Jake, because I got a couple more. Are you good on time, man? Yep, I'm good. Got another like 15, 20 minutes because I got some that are that are very interesting to me. Um, and actually it's follow on of a couple of interviews of, of you that I listened to, but there's always this, it's kind of common knowledge amongst livestock people or hunters that how animals are harvested uh, affects, you know, the the texture of the meat and you know how it tastes and a lot of these different different things, the pH, pH level. And I'll be honest with you and the listener. I always thought this was like partial myth to, mm. to, to be honest with you. I, I didn't even know that it was totally true. So I, so I dug into a bunch of academic literature and it's actually fairly well studied. Um, and I, I uh, so it was, it was eye opening to me like, Oh yeah, this, this is, this is a thing. Um, and, and comment on it in the, in the, um, in the context that you've been a recreational hunter and you're and you're now harvesting these animals the way that we've already discussed within your business. Do you notice a difference, Jake? Like in the it, those factors of the meat, and like even how it tastes or how it looks. Uh, let let me let me know what you think on that. Yeah. Um, so we now know it like to be a hundred percent true. So we actually have a study coming out here in about a month and a half that measured the oxidative stress of a bunch of our animals um, that we harvested compared to 120 ranches across North America for cattle. Okay. It measures, it measures phytochemical and all the different things. And like all of the oxidative stress that comes along with like stress while harvesting and how that affects like meat quality. And it varied a bunch through the cattle, but basically ours was like zero because that animal is essentially under no stress. Cause if it starts walking, it moves away. But you know, what's interesting is I don't notice it as much as my wife does. So no, in, does in like, the actual meat. So she, she does the vast majority of the cooking. And like, when I go out and I now bow hunt something and bringing home, she's like, you can eat that because <laughs> the animal that comes home through our commercial harvesting, a, it's a lot cleaner, but B Good. specifically texture and color, not necessarily taste sometimes, but like texture and color can be completely different. Yeah. And it's, it's, we eat venison and salmon. Like that's all we eat. And so she, it's like, she can really notice the difference when I'm trying like put something on the plate that's different, but anecdotally through a whole bunch of um, work that we've done, we also give you a great example. We did a, um, 
we did a project that was a 400 acre area that was fenced and we we're we we're looking to move remove the last amount of those deer and the deer in there understood that they were in a pen like they had been in there for like several months they're figuring out like they are constantly trying to figure out how to get out we were still um rendering them all in the head like we we're still shooting them all in the head yeah but rigor mortis which is the process of basically all of your glycogen stores in your muscle moving and like or lactic acids to glycogen and like vice versa that entirely depends on how stressed you are prior to dying and that's what creates rigor mortis that's what like helps basically as what you feel as a hunter is how stiff they get how quickly sure. so those animals that we harvested under like they were they were stressed in that situation and they were mentally stressed they didn't actually know we were there went into rigor mortis like three times as fast as our harvested like our commercially harvested animals so that's the best gauge of how stressed they are is how fast they move into rigor mortis because they they've burned all of those sugar stores which typically like convert to lactic acids and starts like the slow breakdown of your body when you die um yeah. and those animals were stiff in minutes compared to a commercially harvested animal that like is under no stress it's never penned it's never baited like those animals take hours yeah and that like that changes like coloration and texture like they get paler and they get like that meat like that muscle meat is stiffer even though they're still being shot in the head so when you think of like a hunter and um even some of the best shots that animal still takes 30 seconds 45 seconds 50 like um oh yeah 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 that's, that's the, and or worse norm. right yeah yeah sure so it absolutely um it absolutely affects texture and taste but for somebody that doesn't know the difference or like doesn't have like that constant comparison it'd be pretty an, an elk that died in three minutes versus 30 seconds still tastes amazing right yeah it's hard to, yeah yeah they're not going to have the 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 data set to see such a difference like you are. yeah but we definitely um it's crazy we definitely see it and can taste it here just because of how often we do it yeah yeah and it, well it makes for a unique product right i mean you probably you, you know even an axe basically even a you know an axis deer hunter can't necessarily replicate exactly what what you guys are providing um yeah. and, and it's it's interesting i mean the the whole thing's interesting i mean we've hit on a lot of that stuff jake like you know as hunters it's not uh there's still differences right the you know yeah. how clean it is you know how you know how the animal is harvested uh there's a bunch of stuff that honestly if you would ask me five six years ago i would have been like that ah, doesn't matter you know what i mean but yeah. there is a difference and this one in particular i'm sure it's because there's so much economics around the efficiency of just feeding this world there's a lot of there's actually a lot of research on exactly what you said you know just them trying to be more efficient um you know and more effective at killing animals in these slaughterhouses and stuff to to minimize that 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 change um but uh but it's it the way you said about it being the where they're pinned up you're you're basically saying that their life's like in in a way they're their lifestyle in the previous X amount of time, it also matters. It's not just how they're killed. Is that, yeah. is that basically what you're, what you're getting at there? Yeah. And we do very like few projects where any animals penned, like all of the, um, all of the commercial harvesting we do, none of them are penned and everything else. Um, and that's why we get like such great, like, you know, meat quality out of that. But we purposely, and I think it probably started because we were hunters, like, we've purposely developed all of the systems to like keep them wild and never pen them and never beat them because we know yeah. it originally started as like, it felt like the right thing to do. And now we know it produces a much better like product, which wasn't ever really the plan. It was just, it felt like the right thing to do originally. Right. Yeah, sure. Well, and like you said earlier, you have the tools to be able to do it that way. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, and I have a life, you know, I grew up from a cattle ranching family and stuff. So in my mind, at, at first when somebody shows me your business model, I'm like, well, why wouldn't you just pin them up and yeah. like, you know, yeah. re, you know, bring them domestically, have an efficient process at doing it. And, and you've brought up a lot of reasons, reasons why that, why that doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, you know, I had a, I have a totally random question for you, Jake. And 
you hit on it here and I heard you talk about it in the previous podcast. You talk about when you were um when you were younger, you you moved to eating a lot of axis deer for a period of time. And I have a it's it's really just a personal question because I eat a lot, I eat a lot of game meat, but I also eat a lot of red meat. And I have found that for me personally, I I can't only eat lean game meat. Or I, or I actually get like a drop in energy, like pretty significant, Jake. Did, did you ever notice, did you ever notice that? Um, or do you have any in, insight on that? And what, and what I found works for me is to eat a fair amount of red meat that has, that has way higher fat content. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, man? Uh, yeah. So I kind of, um, I landed at a similar place. That's why we do salmon. Oh, Okay. So- I think it's the like those DHAs and omega threes that you're not getting in such a lean animal. Even though we now know, again, part of that study, which was pretty, pretty crazy, is our our omega threes and six, like our omega six threes nines, like a lot of those primary amino acids are like four times higher in axis deer than they are in beef, which seems counterintuitive because they're so lean, yeah. but the intramuscular fat that they do have is just super high in those like critical fats. I think with the way that they're eating, but I still don't think it's enough. Like we do either local fish here that I like I spear fish um, or salmon because yeah, it's just not quite enough, but yeah. Whole when when you have like you've eaten nothing but deer for two or three months and then you have like a real steak from like a great, cow your buddy gives you yeah like yeah there's there's nothing quite like it for sure but we are um i think adding salmon in really helps with a lot of the fat levels that you're probably not getting with like primarily game but we do know and and we can circle back to this in the months to come but we do now know with like some of this data that's going to come out that um wild game as a function of like phytochemicals all of the macros even the fats are significantly healthier for you than um, grain or grass fed cattle, which is really, really interesting. Yeah, for sure it is. I mean, it makes sense given all that we've talked about, but it's, yeah. it's very, it's very intriguing. And I, that, that kind of leads me to the next uh, question, Jake. I mean, I do, I love the concept. I, everybody should check out your website um, and I'll give you a chance here at the end to, to pit where they can find you. Um, what's like the, do you, do you see this as something going beyond axis deer eventually or wh- where where like where's your where's your end state on the business uh, um, have you thought about that the, i mean the end this is really a place-based solution so like sure. the end state for us is really to make sure we're collectively utilizing this resource like for what's best for like community here locally but what we've built which is really interesting is like mobile harvesting systems um and so like there's invasive ungulates mammals like across the planet in all these different places that same thing are like completely unmanaged or mismanaged. And like, I don't know if it ever gets bigger than that. Like we are going to do, you know, we were only doing three or 4,000 deer last year and we're going to do 15 to 20,000 deer like next year. And so I'm sure we're going to like figure out at scale what, breaks and what works and what doesn't work yeah Um, sure but i think um yeah i think and i think we've hit on it a bunch of times in this conversation but having that baseline data that says like what is balance what's sustainable what works for community farmers ranchers ecosystems reefs like that like that whole system it can be replicated in different places for sure like much better data can only serve our communities better across the board and like make better decisions. So like that comes along with the harvesting system. Um, So I think to answer your question, the end game is for sure, just to take care of this place first. Um, And then once we see it operating at scale, like can we, Japan has 5 million invasive deer. Yeah. Like sure. what else, what else does that look like? What else does like having really great data, um, you know, I have to assume, I, I don't know, like human nature is interesting, but like market hunting has had such a negative impact throughout North America, you know, over the last hundred years. Um, and like, similarly, like we talked about in New Zealand, like 
would they made those same decisions if they had great data every single day? Like, would they have kept shooting all of those Buffalo if they knew that like that right. was going to be like, it, it just makes me wonder, like, I still have a lot of, I mean, hope in humanity that they make great decisions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I think you nailed it, man. I mean, one on your business front to me, this is just my brain, like cranking in the background. I'm like, well, maybe what Jake's really built is, you know, a system and technology business and he doesn't really know it, you know, he's just sure. perfecting that and he's going to apply to all, all sorts of different, different things uh, on this, on this planet. But you bring up the, the market, the market hunting deal and, and uh, I'd love to get your insight on it. I, I actually think that particularly as North American hunters, we, we look at that and we look at all the regulations around that is very important um, there's, you know, there's really a negative context around market hunting for, for good reason. But I kind of, I, I wonder Jake, if history has not been distorted around what actually, what actually happened a little bit. I, I, in a way, you know, let's take the Buffalo thing. Really what happened was it that the, there were these, you know, a bunch of drunk cowboys out there just shooting everything until it was gone. Or was it just a, a strategic mistake? You know, yeah. that, that, you know, some financial interest and, you know, some overexcitement about it, uh, people got ahead of themselves and then you could, that you couldn't turn the clock back. Right. Yeah. Um, I wonder how much of that is actually going on. And, and that gets to your point about if they had the information like, Hey, we're beyond these things being able to recover in the, in some, you know, reasonable amount of time, like let's stop shooting them. I, I wonder what really would have happened. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, um, and I think we'll never, you know, we never quite have the answers to some of that. And and again, like market, the negative connotations of market hunting come back to the conversation of resource availability and that resource always being available to the public, right? That's the conflicting conversation there is like market hunting is going to limit the resource availability for hunters. And I think that's always been a function of like data in the long run, but as a, as a great example you know market hunting has a, like persisted in europe for hundreds and hundreds of years right like all of the stations and all of these places throughout like ireland and all these different places like there's always been market hunting in those places and um i think there's lots of great like information to pull on some places have done it really well some places haven't um but again it's just like keeps coming back to data like i wouldn't like again would never tackle this thing without that data um yeah because just the um the daily uncertainty would probably kill me <laughs> yeah yeah no i hear it but but it's it in the end it's still a real interesting topic yeah. and i'm sure yeah. you know i'm sure you know more about it jake so let me know if i say anything that's incorrect and, and i and i think a lot of the listeners probably understand this but you know there's not i mean if you eat elk at a restaurant or wild boar at a restaurant it's not actually though it's not wild animals right no. um yeah. I, I actually kind of find it stunning that that menus can represent it that way it's almost like false advertisement yeah but you hear people say that all the time they're like oh i've tried elk i tried it at you know x restaurant it's like well you didn't you didn't try elk you know um yeah. and, and so i think a lot of the listeners on this this podcast will understand that but but some that might be new information too but i think it's important because that that there's negative consequences to that regulation too, from what I understand, you know, it's hard. I, I mean, there's a lot of people who really enjoy hunting. I'm sure it's the same way in Hawaii and they, they just end up with too much meat. It's not going to stop them from, yeah. from hunting because they enjoy hunting. It's how they spend time with their family, how they spend their disposable income. It's awesome, but it's difficult to get rid of or not get rid of. It's difficult to, to, efficiently get that meat to somebody that could use it because of some of these these laws is that is that correct yeah absolutely and i think some states have done and i don't know enough about this to speak as an expert but some states have done a really good job with some of those hunters for hungry program yeah. where you can go in turn in a carcass it moved through a state inspected facility so it can be checked and everything else and then like move to the community as like donations for food but that's like slaughter and processing facilities are getting few and far between. Like every time, like 
every year one dies here in Hawaii and I'm sure that's happening across, you know, like North America as well too. So yeah, it, it's really hard to get, um, to, it's getting harder to share. Um, yeah, sure. Cause it used yeah. to be, I'm guessing really easy where you would go down the street and everybody on your, on your street, if you took them like some, like some great cuts of venison in, in your classic, like brown paper would be like, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But you walk three houses down your street now, like you have no idea what the response is going to be when you knock on the door and be like, Hey, do you want some venison? Like it's yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> it, I, I totally agree. And, and I, in some ways, man, and this is like a, uh, a, a, uh, conversation way out of the uh, the realm of I guess hunting, but I think I, I hope, and it seems to be the case that COVID's kind of changed this a little bit, at least the momentum of it a little bit. You know, I know yeah. I know like the the cattle industry and you know other livestock industries in the U.S. have gotten a little you know a little eye. Well, the public has gotten an eye opener of like, look, all this stuff's getting processed in like two facilities or four, yeah. facilities, you know, in and people are like, this is a real big problem. It's like, well, the re the regulatory environment's what created that, you know? Um, yeah. So will that change is the momentum? I, I mean, I'm kind of hopeful it does, man. I think even beyond this, the, the hunting realm that we're talking about, I mean, there's tons of opportunity for us with modern technology to, to, you know, have smaller ways of distributing meat yeah. or what, you know, whatever kind of, kind of food. So. Yeah. And um, we have lots of like great, um, yeah, I, I think what's interesting about what we do is is just it's a resource that um, we have lots of people that write us in and say, oh, now I'm going to try hunting. So they wanted to start like they were interested in it as a food resource. And then they got a box and they tried it and they're like, wow, this is amazing. We get lots of messages that say like, where do I start as a hunter? So it's interesting that it's serving as like food in hopefully a gateway to like them maybe becoming a hunter and understanding like the total value of being in these wild places and like getting to go on all these amazing adventures. And um, so, yeah, if it, um, we certainly hope like that introduction can help our hunting community as well in the future. Yeah, no, that's uh that's awesome. And I could see how that occurs And and while we're on that, Jake, let people know how they could, how they can, you know, look you up, follow you you know, if they want to buy some axis deer meat, give the, give them the rundown on that. Yeah. So it's all everything. The vast majority of it is based out of our website. So Maui Nui Um, we do social media, but not well. Uh, that's <laughs> we're not, we're not huge fans, but, uh, we're on Instagram at Maui Nui Venison. Um, and yeah, we've, we, we base a lot of great information off the site. There's videos there. There's like survey results are on there. Like a lot of, uh, we share almost everything that we collect. So it all lives on that website. So if you dig into that website past kind of the pages where you can buy something, there's lots of great info for somebody that's interested. Sweet, man. Well, cool. I, I really appreciate your time, Jake. I know I'm, I'm stretching it here. We're going to, we're going to get into an hour and a half, but thanks, man. It was awesome. I, I could, I got like a thousand more questions in the back <laughs> of my head, man, but I'm going to, I'm going to let you go. Um, the main takeaway I think listeners should, should think about is, you know, one, there's tons of knowledge in here about just access deer in general, but it's you, it, what you're, what you're offering is unique, man. It's really like the only, as far as I know, it's one of the very, very few sources of wild game meat that you can't, that, that doesn't involve you having to do it as a, as a hunter. So that's pretty cool, man. I'm glad that you, you found a way to like break that mold and have that an option for people. So thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it, Cliff. Thank you. All right, folks. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. If you like this style of video, let me know. And if there's anyone out there you want me to reach out to and try to interview, also let me know. I'm more than willing to do this. I have a good time doing it, guys. If you did get value from the video, please do me a favor and like it and subscribe to the channel. Thanks, guys.